I'm assuming that you've already watched The Mahogany Clock Part 1, and if you did, you would have seen it end with this scene. And while this glue here is drying, I may as well get started on the dust collection system for the lathe. This whole thing is just going to be made out of scraps that I had laying around. It doesn't have to look pretty, it just has to work. I had this 4 inch hose fitting left over from a project that I had scrapped. I'm glad that I took the trouble to cut this fitting out. It's going to come in real handy here. And again, I'm only using the pinner to hold this thing in place so it doesn't slide around when I put the clamps on. And I know that it's going to shoot into the box maybe half an inch. But what I'm planning on doing is bending the pins over in the direction that the airflow is naturally going to go. And that way no shavings will get caught on the pins. This copier works pretty good, once you get used to it. But it would be quite easy to ruin one of these blanks. And I only made 10 blanks for the 10 finials that I need for the clock. So I'd better be careful. Well, there we go. That's finial number two finished. Well, almost finished. Gotta sand it yet. Even though these finials were pretty rough, I was surprised at how quickly the sandpaper got them nice and smooth here. I started out with 80, worked my way up to 220, and once it's all assembled I'm sure I'm going to be doing more sanding with finer sandpaper before I start varnishing. I was a little bit concerned here because I could really see where that seam was on the blanks, but once I turned them down on the lathe, you could hardly see it at all. I'm happy with this. And here we are, this is the last one. And I was able to use just the 10 blanks. I didn't have to make an extra one. I'm really happy about that. And as you can see, they turned out just the way I drew them on the computer. This sawdust you see laying around here, that was from before I got the dust collection system going. After that, no sawdust anywhere. Okay, it's time to sand the back and the front. Make them nice and smooth and flat. And this machine, well, it works really great. It's a little on the slow side, so I'm going to speed up the video here. And that joint that I made earlier is so nice and tight. You can tell where it is, but you can't see it, if that makes any sense. The frame for the front of the clock only took about two passes on each side to make it nice and smooth and flat, and that's because the joints were already pretty flush. Even though the grain in both these pieces is running in the same direction, the joint can be seen, but the joint is nice and tight. And, as you'll see later, it's going to be basically covered up. It's time to start the main body of the clock, and here I'm just measuring to make sure that the sides are going to be the same length as the front. I dadoed out the sides where the top and the bottom are going to go. Here clamps are squeezing in tightly on the sides to hold the top and the bottom tightly in those dadoed out slots while the glue dries. I'm turning down another piece here that's going to be the same contour as the finials and it's going to be split in half up the middle and uh, I'll be able to show you. It's easier to show than to tell. I'm making half rounds here out of one and a half inch lumber, and the finials will sit on top of these. The glue on the main body of the clock is dry now, and although all the joints did fit together not too bad, I want to sand them down so that they're nice and flush. The half rounds are being glued onto the sides now. And you can see on the top here where the finial will be centered into place. Give the illusion of one continuous column. And here the half rounds are being glued to the front of the clock. And uh, this framework is actually going to be one large door. 
You'll see why when we get near the end of the video. Remember that piece that I was turning down on the lathe and I said it was easier to show you than to tell you? Well now I'm going to show you. I think the finial is going to look a lot better like this. Here I've rounded off the back edge of the frame and it gives that simulated column a nice rounded look. I trimmed this board at an angle so that the grain would run parallel with the edges. This board was a full three quarters of an inch thick and I had to plane it down to match the rest of the frame. And here's that board fastened in place, and you can see why I wouldn't want the grain running at an angle. I'm going to start on the little doors now that are going to go on the front of the clock, and I want the pieces to be one inch wide, and that means that I'm going to have a very narrow little sliver left over, which would actually make a really nice pendulum stem. So I'm going to round one of these over before I cut it, and that'll give me a nice rounded front for the pendulum stem. You'll see. This cutter is specially designed to remove your fingers faster than you can say ouch. And there we are, a real mahogany pendulum rod. I had two pieces that were already pretty much the right length for the pendulum door, but I needed six more pieces about 11 inches long. Here we have just enough pieces for the doors, but I'm not going to cut them into length yet. It's been my experience that the router works a lot better with longer pieces than shorter pieces. I don't want these pieces to be completely rounded over. I want them to be a little bit flat on the face. So I'm going to select a bit here that I think will do the job. Give it a test here. I think that'll be just about right. As you can see, I'm really big on dust collection, but hey, I could have hooked my shop back up as well if I tried. I think this is going to be okay. Because these doors are going to be glass with mahogany frames, I have to rabbit out the mahogany here where the glass is going to go. These little pieces are easier to sand now than after they're all assembled. I've already got the length figured out for each piece, and now it's just a case of cutting the 45 degree angles for the corners. And here I'm just laying them out just to make sure that I really did get them right before I go to all the work of gluing them together and find out they're wrong. Now I know that a bot dial would look a lot nicer than one that I designed myself, but I wanted to design one myself. So here I am on the computer designing a dial. Now if I print the dial out on paper, even glossy photographic paper, it's going to be easily smudged. So I've got to try and figure out a way to protect it. And I had thought of, well, maybe I could uh, spray it with clear coat. And then I thought of this two-part epoxy that I'd used many years ago when I made a checkerboard. And that turned out pretty nice. And I'm going to experiment with that here. I'm using Envirotex light here. And the size I bought works out to about a dollar an ounce. So I don't want to be wasting any. So that's why I'm putting this border all around the outside. It'll help keep it from flowing off the edges. Okay, this is just going to be sort of a test dial. If it turns out good, I'll use it for something else, not for this clock. But at least it'll give me an idea if it's going to work. I'm using 5-minute epoxy here to hold it all together and seal up the edges so it won't leak. The surface to be covered has to be perfectly level. Otherwise, what's going to happen is the epoxy is going to run more to one side than the other. 
and putting that little block of wood directly on the printout, that wasn't a good idea. I mixed up four ounces. We'll see how things go here. You can see around the edges where it's a little blotchy. Well, I guess that's where the epoxy must be working its way in the edges. But one nice thing, the ink doesn't run. I was kind of worried about that. I've seen some people on YouTube using a sealer on paper, and it seemed to work pretty good. I'm going to get some of that, solve my problem here. 